Professor Pat Dolan is the Director of the UNESCO Child and Research Centre in the University of Galway and Killian Murphy is an actor. Um, I, Pat's got a better title than you. <laughs> <laughs> You're also actually patron of the UNESCO Child and Research Centre. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and Pat, you, you've produced a lovely book, uh, Unva, the Empathy Book for Ireland. So we, before we get into the broader issue, maybe tell us about the book first. Thanks, Brendan. Well, uh, the book, we really came up with the idea of the book, I think, about two years ago. And with uh, two great colleagues, Mark Brennan from Penn State and my own, uh, my own university, Gillian Brown, with Killian, we decided that we'd try and reflect what empathy is like in Ireland, look at it from the point of view of people who are well-known and then everyday citizens as well, to try and get a, 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 almost like a cross stem picture of what empathy, the word empathy means to people in Irish society. And thanks to you, Brendan, indeed, for your brilliant uh, essay. In oh, the stop well. now, Pat. <laughs> no, no, it's great, very, 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 very well received. And we also decided that we would do it as a fundraiser for the schools programme that we're, we're heavily involved in and that Killian has been a fantastic patron of. But the idea of the book really was to, in a way, think about the word empathy as not been about sympathy, as about compassion, about yeah. something that we can do for other people and what that, how we've experienced that. Some of the essays are very personal, some are more analytical, there's prose, there's poetry. And, you know, a great selection of, of very well-known people who really came forward so willingly. One thing that struck me about, and I think it struck Killian as well, was how much the word can, the word empathy actually connected for people. Uh, and, you know, with COVID and everything else, we don't want to get into COVID, but it, it is a word that does have currency for people, maybe more so now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and Killian, as Pat says, you, you're not just here, I heartily endorse this product or service. You've been actually quite deeply involved with Pat's work for a number of years now, haven't you? Yeah, for about 10 years now, uh, we've been working together and, you know, the work that uh, Pat and his team do in Galway is, is fantastic. And, you know, it, 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 it was... Um, interesting for me to reflect on it on empathy and what it means to me personally yeah. when pat you know suggested the idea but and and the book and you know the you know the the, the program has been in what is that a hundred schools now or something yeah. like that pat, yeah. secondary schools so just to explain this is a it's a schools program for secondary schools about uh teaching kids empathy yeah. essentially is it's activating a, yeah it's like a, a module that can be taught in schools and the plan is to get it out to get it in every secondary school in ireland we have it in about a hundred and every school in ireland will get a copy of the book and a copy of the program as well but yeah just in my own life i suppose i was thinking about what how it's relevant to me and i think it's relevant to me in my in my job mm. you know when i thought about it i think it's probably at the heart of the actor's craft if i can use that yeah, word yeah. you know i think you know it's essential to be empathetic to understand another character and you know one of the definitions of empathy is to the you know to be able to walk in someone else's shoes and that's essentially what you do as an actor that's that's your job yeah and so then, of it's, course, it's kind of acting is kind of extreme empathy in a way then it, yeah, you, yeah you you have to be non-judgmental and you have that's to listen thing, you know? because like tommy shelby to to, to name one like it mm. must be very it must be very uh challenging to feel empathy for a person like that in a way it's easy to empathize with people who are nice I guess, but you, 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 you must go in just completely open and, and, and just uh, trying to figure out what motivates someone or why someone has gotten into the position that they are. And all, the, all of those things are applicable in, in, in the real world in terms of empathy, you know. And then the other, the other factor was being the, the, the dad of two, two boys, you know, and that, yeah. that, that uh, I think it's very important for us raising boys that they, we treat, teach them empathy and try and raise empathetic lads, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Pat, in in terms of you say in the book that empathy is the foundation for functioning societies, that is the secret sauce. Well, so, why is it so good for us, and why is it so important for society? Well, I think from three perspectives. I mean, we we often talk a lot about well being and resilience, and their words we use kind of as important for individuals and collectively for communities. But, you know, we, we can think of politicians, for example, who have great well-being, but they have no empathy. Well-being is about yourself. Empathy is about how you are to others. And um, empathy is about the capacity, as Killian says, to walk in other people's shoes. But it's also the capacity to be able to reach out. And if we think, for example, of how we responded around COVID as, as communities okay. and how in our, I'm getting flashbacks to the small area we could walk, we got to know our neighbours. Actually, we had enforced empathy 
almost upon us. Yeah. Uh, and it did, and that challenged us. Uh, and empathy is a practice. It's not, it's not uh, you know, a saintly state that you go to. It's something that you practice. And we have to, you know, me include every one of us here and listening, it's something that we have to practice. But it is the difference. It's the secret sauce because it is the difference, for example, in the youth being less narcissistic, less you know, into homophobic bullying, less into labelling disabled or whatever it is. It's the one common thread and that's kind of one of the reasons why we're very passionate about it. And I, you know, I ref, you know, reflect my own life. I can think of growing up and I refer to it in the essay yeah. about my mother and, and, and my family's compassion has been really key for me at a difficult time. The research is, and I'm not going to bore you with the research, the research is overwhelming the evidence mm. that if, if young people learn empathy education in schools, they do better in their grades. So you got it at home rather than at school, I'm guessing. Abs- yeah. uh, absolutely. In fact, my, my school experiences, and uh, I'm looking at the two of you, I am older than both of you, but anyway, my school experiences going to an inner city Dublin Christian Brothers School, the youngest of a large family, was frankly horrific. Was, I witnessed violence that I get flashbacks about. So yeah. there was very little empathy. Now there were, and I refer to one particular teacher who was really kind and understood me, but overall, it was definitely from home, and I had a you know, I was fortunate to have it. I was unfortunate I lost a father very young at seven months in an accident, but I was very fortunate that I had an incredibly uh, uh, kind and empathetic mother who and older brothers and sisters, luckily. Um, so, yeah, it is, you know, I think these things are autobiographical, but it's not just kind of Angela's Ashes stories, you know, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, it yeah. actually is about how we engage with other people. Yeah and, yeah. and the evidence, by the way, is that if... You can practice compassion and understanding and you can learn it. And as Killian and I have noted numerous times, young people who learn it in school do better in their grades. It's a really mm-hmm. strong okay. argument. So it, it is a selfish thing as well. It's good for Absolutely. you as well. Yeah. Killian, did you get it at home or how was the empty education in Brez in your day? In Cork? Um, well, I, I come from a pretty matriarchal uh, setup as well at home. Like I was raised by my parents and then my grandmother lived with us at home as well. And there was... There was there was, I feel, great empathy there, particularly from my grandmother, you know. Yeah. Um, we'd go into her if there was any trouble in the gap. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we'd yeah, go into yeah. my granny and she was always there, non-judgmental, always yes. listening to us, you know. And then in school, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's a, you know, you think about it, it's a quarter of a century ago, really, when I was in secondary school. Yeah. And, you know, you, you're probably the same. And and you, you talk about it very well, I think, in your essay. And... You know, you, you, it wasn't probably the ideal environment for me and my interests, but you find your own, you kind of find your own friends and you follow your own path in there. And I, I found what I needed to find in, within the school, you know. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't probably the ideal fit. It's great now, apparently, for all those things. But, uh, yeah, I, I managed to, to figure out what I needed to do in there. In that I, I've heard you talk before because, look, like underlying all this, and we talk about teaching empathy in secondary schools, is is the leaving cert and I suspect the three of us would have the same issues around that whole system but Killian mm. you've talked about it before like you, you, and a lot of the people interesting people or people who've done well in life you notice that they were people that school and the and the exam system mm. possibly didn't work for them yes I mean I think anyone who's been through the the leaving cert system uh, like we <laughs> I still get flashbacks. I, I, like I, I regularly have those yeah. leaving cert dreams. Yeah, I absolutely do. I mean, I think it's a very flawed metric, isn't it? It doesn't. It can't possibly measure everything that a young person has to offer. It, it really, it really can't. You know, I mean, I was only talking to my dad recently, who, who was, you know, was a teacher and then a, um, an inspector and worked in the in the Department of Education for a long time and he was you know wouldn't it be great if you you know you could get points for empathy you know you yeah, know if you could yeah. actually like that was it you know you could be rated on your your how empathetic you are as a kid or there's loads of other things that, that we, we could measure mm-hmm. young people on but of course we don't it's so it's so driven on uh, and on those few subjects you know yeah Pat there's a there's a quote in the book from Hugh Fitzmaurice, who's a, who's a performance mm. coach, who's in, it's, yeah. and he's talking in the area of education. What if the priority in education was for you to be accepted for your uniqueness, talents, abilities, and insecurities? So basically, the, the, the adding in a bit of empathy education is probably a small thing, but ultimately, possibly, it's about upending the whole 
trust of education, it is, yeah. is it? Yeah, and and Hugh, who uh, was one of the first teachers to actually trial the program for us in uh, CBS Monkstown. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that is kind of the challenge here, really, behind this. Is it's actually it's quite in one way it's a small thing, but another way it's a major thing. And, um, and you know, as Kelly was talking about, kind of the leaving cert experience. Even if we think of uh, young people who don't make it through school, who leave school early. I left school early, and I'm not, you know, was lucky enough to go on, you know, in, in good ways. But for young people, it shouldn't be the defining thing that we think it is. You know, or not getting a leaving or getting a good leaving. It's to make or break for people. And the, I think the uh, the way that... We, and I would say, by the way, we have a community version of the programme as well as a school's version, which we're using with Froiga through guarded version programmes. And it's, you know, it's, it's so far so good, going very well. Um, so I think it's about multiple opportunities. Yeah. It's about how we connect. And I think connection in life is a huge... Can be a very brittle thing. But sure, listen. We've spoke of little else for the last few years. Do. Really, connectivity yeah. has become, our connectedness has become so important. And look, we heard this morning about yeah. just people standing together and everything. Um, so the the program is being is it trialed in schools at the moment? Have the Department of Education actually committed to taking it on? It's, in it, all that's under or? construction at the moment. So yeah. what we've done is we're we're actually working with Faroiga, who have a great youth leadership program in schools as well. We're also working with the GA with uh, Colin Regan Community. And they have a, a brilliant um, Healthy Clubs programme uh, and Future Leaders, and they're in 400 schools. So we're actually, you know, easing it into schools. The problem for teachers is that they're pressed for so much for yeah, time. Yeah. That, But, you know, I've m- made the point, as Killian, uh, I think all of us involved in this, including the colleagues in, in, in the University of Galway, we're, we're actually making the argument now this is actually as important as learning maths. You know, in terms of it, it's, it has to be, you know, really taken seriously. Yeah, look, how, how you connect with other people is probably more important than any of it. But remember, there were always those people, if, there, if anything diverged into talking about touchy-feely stuff, yeah. is this coming up in the exam? They'd yeah. shoot up straight away and <laughs> yeah. that, that'd be the end yeah. of that. Killian, in a way, you talked about your, uh, your teenage lads. Kids are, I would have thought kids are naturally empathetic, aren't they? Like, in a way, it's almost as if we undo it in, in education. Uh, but I think that's been shown uh, in, in research that the, the young, young infants and youngsters are, have a direct access to it. But as they get older, uh, particularly through, through adolescence, it kind of fades away. And they need to, uh, there's also studies that show that they need to uh, experience empathetic acts towards themselves to, to okay. kind of... Uh, to to awaken in in them, you know. Yeah. Um. Y- yeah, but and I think this. It's a lot of it. It is about just communication. It seems to me. Certainly, with our lads, we, we have to just keep talking to them. Do you know? And and you know, Pat was saying that there's a you know the difference between empathy and well being and all of that is that empathy is about the other. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really key to it. Is trying to understand the other. And there's also the, didn't you talk about a lot, Pat, about you know zones of empathy? Yeah. You know, we can be very empathetic towards people that are like us. Exactly, and, yeah. You yeah. know, that we recognize, but people that are other, we're far less empathetic towards them. And, and, and that's what you really want to try and teach those kids, yeah. you know, at that but age. You, if you also think, and like, you know, I've teenagers as well now, and you think about the world they're growing up into in terms of the difference between when we were teenagers the othering is practically baked into yeah. the social media, how they communicate. It's baked into how we set up discussions as a society like yeah. that. There's me and, and, and you and I don't listen to you and everything's an argument. And the, but that's the point of this yeah. really is that, this, that you'd, you'd want to you'd wanna teach that generation uh, about that and make them aware of that. You know, Because the, the social media that you talk about, it's so emotionally uh, demanding for those kids. <laughs> You know, and you'd hope that they would develop a new language and that when they come to run the country and write the books and make the films, they will have a different access. Yeah, I, th- I think, and in addition to that, like we did a randomized controlled trial on this. So it was a pretty high level study and Charlotte Silk and Bernie led, colleagues led on it. One of the things we found was that young people who received the program compared to young people who didn't, their empathy, their levels of empathy increased, their desire for pro social behavior for doing yeah. good increased. The big issue, I think, actually, is young people aren't given sometimes given enough opportunity to do it. That might be 
part of the problem. I mean, and the way the, 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 the module works is that it's four things. It's very simple. Understanding yeah. empathy, practicing it. What are the barriers in your life to being more empathetic? And then you do a social action project. You do something to do good for somebody else. And that so this, and, and this, it's a muscular thing. It's empathy in yeah. action. This is mm. not yeah. about oh, like absolutely. amateur psychology or whatever. No, it's not about, I, I'm, I'm, a mere applied sociologist. It's absolutely about the real world of civic society. It's not, yeah. you know, I mean, neuroscience has proven that because of the plasticity in the brain, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I've read up on it, that the, the teenage brain is still growing. And one of the good things, that one of the, the things that is growing is the capacity in your brain to develop empathy. So it's about grasping that opportunity and using formal and non-formal uh, school and community context to do so. And it's interesting, you said earlier, it's a practice like rather than a trait. So then what about grown-ups if, with, with our, our brains set in stone now at this stage? Can we work on our own empathy? Absolutely. I yeah. Think, yeah. Uh, probably from listening to young people a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, you know, and, you know, it, the, the, the irony is, of course, when, you know, you're setting yourself up in a way and you say you're, you're promoting an empathy program because anything you do wrong, is an usher, that fella, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. It, it, but I think, you know, if we think of how um, we've reached out to the Ukrainian community, you know, there are things that we do as a society, you know, that makes us move or moves us. The, you do get empathy fatigue and you do get empathy distress. Uh, and we need to be aware of those things, but we just need to kind of countermand them in, in our own head. But it's very much about behaviour. And in fact, one of the early studies we did from the, with the Irish Research Council, we, what we discovered was that uh, young people get empathy from parents, of course, they get it from f community. They get it from very close things to them. But one of the downsides of that is that they think their world is only close and they have less empathy for what's far away. Mm. And I think it's the same for adults. You know, why is it that we, as adults, sometimes label others, you yeah. know, um cuz yeah a lot of us don't have a diversity of people in in in, in our lives though as part of the problem it, it's interesting you mention about the uh, our welcome of ukrainians which is it's a complex enough thing but just in general do you think are irish people fairly empathetic in general i think we are yeah i think overall i think we are um but again it's interesting i i was involved in the depths of uh, COVID in doing a global study for UNESCO on the impact of COVID on youth. It was a hundred countries. So I was on Zoom at all hours of the morning with uh, young people in West Bengal and in Mumbai and they were talking about what it was like in the caste system and trying to show empathy when p people were dying a lot more there than here. Um, and that was a far away kind of thing for me in a, in a way. Yeah. But it did highlight, it, you know, one of the learnings for me is that I think Irish people are empathetic. I think we have it in our culture. Um, I think you, I don't think we should take it for granted. That yeah. can change. That's the thing that I learned, is that it's not it's not a, a given at all times. And you can get an increase in kind of profiling of people. And that's a risk that is there. You know, we've seen that in the, you know, in the past around referendums and various things that we've had around social. Ireland's a really strange country. If you think of yeah, social policy. Why, yeah, why? Well, we're the, we were one of the last countries in the world, not sorry, in Europe, to bring in uh, divorce. And we were one of the first countries in the world to have a same-sex marriage referendum. So is it that like is it that like when a tipping point came, we move we move yeah. really fast then suddenly. So I'll, I'll, did did a lot change here very quickly oh, in terms of absolutely, yeah. and was it in terms of who we were or who we were allowed to be publicly? Like, were we always okay? But was it kind of held down by you know the forces that? We, I think it was held down by the forces a little yeah. bit, but I think we just basically grew up a little bit. I think I mean to be putting it very bluntly, I think we just yeah. loosened out a bit. You know, but wasn't it really driven by young people? You know, that's the yeah. thing, and that's that's that this whole thing is aimed at. I mean. Yeah, yeah. I notice when when I read pieces about you, Killian, that by Irish people, there's this great pride that. He could have lived in San Francisco. He used to live in London, but he came back to Dublin to rear his kids. So presumably you feel this is a kind of a, a healthy place to, to raise kids rather than elsewhere, yeah? I think so. I mean, I, I've always been very proud of the fact that I am Irish and you know, my wife is Irish and 
the kids were of a certain age and we wanted them to to uh, be close to their parents and you know just there's less people here <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's that 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 was um a consideration and it was the best decision we made to come back 100 percent yeah uh, it really but was. It, it presumably makes life and work more complicated for you to to be here i uh, not really i mean no? it's just you're always away when you're working you know you're yeah. never you're rarely at home that that rarely happens so you're just away from a different place and i'd rather be in ireland you know yeah, I think that's a narrative of Irish people to go away and to come back. You know, it seems to be certainly in 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 my game. It seems to be people go away for a long period, to kind of to uh, establish yourself or whatever it might yeah. be to prove that you can play other parts other than Irish parts, and then to come home. Yeah, and it feels different when 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 you're back. Then do you feel different in yourself? You feel home in a way you yeah. don't when you're away. I just, yeah. I just, I just really like Irish people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come here, uh, I was interested in the, your piece in the book. You alluded to earlier about the, the acting thing. I think people would say that you use stillness to great effect on screen. But I now realize, having read your piece, that what you're actually doing is listening, which you were saying is the, the key to acting, but also is the key to empathy as well, that we need to listen more. I, I think there's a crossover. And certainly as a young actor, that was that was one thing you'd hear repeated a lot uh, listening is acting and I, and I think it's true I, th I think if you if as an audience member you're watching a scene and if the other if one of the performers is not concentrated or not in the scene or is thinking about their line the audience just reads it straight away the camera reads it straight away and then I think the same is true in life you know if you've really been listened to mm. yeah yeah we just feel it um, and really really heard and I and I say in the piece it's I think that's an empathetic act to truly listen to someone. And I say in the piece also, you know, sympathy is, or advice is kind of the enemy of uh, empathy because with advice, all you're doing really is adding your own pain or pity to whatever someone else is yeah. going through. It, it, it's not essentially that helpful. Whereas you just listen or, or like the, the etymology of um, empathy is interesting because it comes from a German word, which means yeah. feeling into I think that's very instructive about mm -hmm. what it is. You know, yeah, you kind of yeah. have to feel into what the other person Don't is they experiencing. Say symp sympathy and advice is like standing at the top of the hole, shouting down into the person, yeah, whereas absolutely. empathy is get into the hole and be exactly. there with them. Yeah, and and if you're distressed and you need somebody to be empathetic with you, and they're not, you know immediately that you're not. It's very recognisable when you need it and you don't get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's lacking. You know. Yeah. Yeah, um, we're going to take a piece from the from the book now in in a second. Um, Killian, can I just ask you what you're up to? I presume the fact that you're here means you're resting, as you say, in the business at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm taking it easy. I I did a job and I finished in May, and I've just been at home. That was the Oppenheimer movie, was it? Yes. Yeah. 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 So I'm just at home now. Yeah. And you, you've mentioned before, and this is back to the empathy as well. It can take a while to shake shake it off yeah it, it can uh, yeah um it can but it's just you know you're involved in something f for like 17 hours a day and y you know you're intensely involved in something and i think that's the case for any job that you get heavily involved with it takes a while to shake it off you know people go on holidays and the first week is a write-off yeah you're, <laughs> you're just not relaxed it's the same except it's it's more prolonged and there's a res residual thing that hangs around for a while yeah but it's not anything <clears throat> magical or weird it's just by the nature of the immer immersive nature of the work you know yeah so when you're off then you just you, you forget about all that and just move to your own yeah yeah i like doing very unremarkable things yeah <laughs> that's okay. my thing well, look i'd say people would say you do enough remarkable you, you're allowed <laughs> your time off all right um Let's let's take a, a piece for us, so before we finish off so our our she's our own port laureate but she's in the book Rita Ann Higgins good morning Hi, Brendan. How are you doing? I'm great. It's lovely to hear your voice again, Rita Ann. So well, you, you have a much. fantastic poem in, in the book, and you're going to read it for us now. What's it called? It's called He Fell Through the Cracks, and I was delighted that Killian and Pat and the other editor, Gillian Brown, accepted the poem when I... They requested a poem, and this is what I sent in, and they took the first one I sent. He Fell Through the Cracks. The boy's name was Abel. At times he was funny, oftener he was sad. He was nonverbal himself, the voices in his head like a Greek chorus never took a tea break. He couldn't tell you what they said. 
he went around the house with his hands covering his ears, trying to block out the hubbub. His mother cried the day the van came. They put him in an adult psych ward. He shared the ward with four men who had their own demons. They never got a weekend pass, much less a visitor with some smokes. Abel deteriorated, his mother told doctors, a flock of them around his bed, the white swans of cool. What's wrong, love? she'd say. He couldn't tell her what toy he wanted, his remote control, dinosaur, his ninja set. She guessed on and on for a solid week. Every toy he owned was named some twice over. He slid into the quieter rooms in his head. He didn't cover his ears anymore. When his file was analysed, the professional said, Abel fell through the cracks. He went in in a van, a jalopy of a thing. He came home in a box, a pencil case of a thing. Thank you. That was beautiful, Rita, and that that was stunning. Thank you so much. And and nice to have you on again. Talk to you soon, Rita, and thanks. Slong, good falling. Slong, slong. Listen, just before we finish up, Killian, you didn't explain this at all. You were obviously starting out from from a, a very lucky point. There's all these texts in about your dad. And oh great! Y- yeah, <laughs> Killian's dad was my inspector in school, special class Mallow. What a man of empathy, a gentleman, huge interest in where the child was at, natural love of the special child. Uh, Killian Murphy's dad, Brown Donna Murk, who was like my first inspector as a newly qualified teacher in Cork, oozed empathy, inspired me so much as a teacher, like father, like son. That's from Norma Buckley. Yeah. So there you go. That's you're carrying on your you're carrying on your dad's good work on <laughs> a wider so scale. Different. Listen, guys, thanks a million, and Unva, the empathy book for an is out now published by Mercier Press Killian Murphy and Professor Pat Dolan thanks guys thanks, thanks Brent. Brent text 51551 